डियर प्योर यूरोलॉजी फेसबुक व्यूअर्स गुड इवनिंग वन एंड ऑल टूडे वी हैव द टॉपिक लिटिल डिफरेंट टॉपिक नॉट एग्जैक्टली द वीडियो बेस्ड प्रेजेंटेशन बट मोस्ट ऑफ द सर्जिकल रिलेटेड डिस्कशन वी वांटेड टू डू द टॉपिक वी हैव चूजन इज आर आई आर एस रेट्रोग्रेड इंट्रारेनल सर्जरी वॉट नॉट टू डू इन आर आई आर एस टू बी ऑनेस्ट टूडे स्पीकर इज वेरी सीनियर फ्रॉम अहमदाबाद डॉक्टर कंदर्प पारिक सर and uh, in fact uh, maybe if i remember correctly uh, in india uh, the rirs has started after 2005 initially dr kandaswami sir in Na uh, south and dr kandarp sarik sir in the uh, the western north part of uh, eastern north part of the uh, india initially these are the first two surgeons after that uh, prabhakaran myself we many people have evolved so they were uh, uh, they have learnt from the seniors going abroad Uh, they have learned by teaching themselves uh, by unlearning relearning and with that uh, they have nearly now uh, more than uh, 15 to 18 years of experience in rirs and as you all know initially lot of uh, antagonism was there lot of the seniors who were very good in pcrl used to say that uh, it should not be done it will not survive but it is, that's not correct the literature says that it has uh, taken up very well and more important is the juniors are learning faster within one month two months after attending the conferences they are doing it but lot of people say that we got fever then we got residual stones we got uretric injuries so many lasers are available stenting non stenting so many issues are there so to be on the safer side today discussion we kept without video presentation before we go to the presentation i because unfortunately dr kandar parik sir was very busy because of his uh, uh, academic activities last year so it is the first time he is taking in pure so we will uh, take brief details about his career and then i will introduce officially and then hand over the program to sir dr kandar sir thank you very much uh, uh, for taking up uh, your time to come to this program uh, first i wanted to ask you uh, the questions i asked repeatedly to everybody who is your mentor in surgery when did you do your uh surgical training ms general surgery training where did you do sir okay so uh, first of all before i answer your question chandra mohan uh, thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to interact with uh, your group your urology and i think it is doing fantastic job you got i think more than 5000 or 10000 people who have already uh, are the members of this uh, group and you are doing excellent academic activity so i first congratulate you for that and keep doing good work so now coming back to your question i did my ms from vj medical college ahmedabad uh, and uh, my mentor was my teacher was dr s m patel who was not only a general surgeon but uh, we started a transplant first transplant program in gujarat at vj uh, medical college uh, civil hospital ahmedabad and our unit was involved in the transplant program so that's how because right from the residency time i was involved in a uh, general surgery plus urology uh, by my boss so that's what prompted me to do uh, urology as my uh, sub specialty so you when did you develop interest in urology after ms you immediately started preparing for urology yeah so after because while doing even surgery ms surgery i was uh, involved in transplant and urology work because there was no separate urology department in civil hospital at that particular time so uh, we were working in urology so that's what uh, that's how i developed interest into urology and then after i passed my ms uh, uh, i worked with the kidney institute uh, civil hospital ahmedabad uh, one of the most premier institute in the country as a initially the tutor and then as a dnp resident and then uh, so that's how i am in urology and then i did my mcs from civil hospital ahmedabad uh, so i got both dnp and mcs in urology because i was registered for dnb also so but during the, your urological training uh, do, do your bosses do uh, uh, pcnl uh, regularly in because ahmedabad is known for early pcnl start was it there uh, pcnl in your department so we actually uh, started pcnl in year uh, 1993 in okay. our department in an, in our department i think the, probably ours was the first batch where we started doing pcnl regularly from 1993 okay so okay. yeah so but there were no much uh, teachers there so at that particular time we learned by making mistakes actually in fact to be very honest to uh, you 
my boss is also very very new to pcnl but uh, uh, i have seen in amdavad urology society so many academicians who is uh, who does regular uh, academic activities right from mayesh deshai sir shriniksha sir yourself uh, uh, so many people maybe future in your son also aditya also how the integrity is maintained what is the reason what is the history of brief one one minute comment on amdavad urology society we are uh, no not to boost or not to talk uh, many of the times any conference is done all of you are united and do the conference different like erythroplasty happens then laparoscopy happens then your ai happens then nadia regularly does the conferences a hub of uh, 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 knowledge sharing uh, in india what, what is the what is the culture how the culture developed so it's it's kind of a owners pride and the neighbors and we situation uh, actually chandramohan amdavad urology association we are a very united uh, group of urologists and we started actually i was one of the person who started uh, amdavad urology association in year way back into year 2000 um and under the leadership of dr my teacher dr pc patel sir and then subsequently dr mayesh desai sir as the president of the and then at that time only we started meeting uh, you know as you meet your colleagues regularly uh, though we are all hardcore competitors to each other in our private practice but at the same time uh, if you keep meeting people and then interact academically the the, the competition part stays but the jealousy parts goes away and that's how um, majority of us are very very good friends and uh, when we start i was the first person to start uh, actually uh, the all uh, advancements in endourology conference in way back in year 2013 uh, focusing on endourology and with the success inspired by the success of that particular conference many of my colleagues in amdavad also started uh, organizing conferences like dr shenik sai is doing on laparoscopy dr shailesh sai is also doing, doing reconstructive urology so all of us are doing a, on a different topic so we are not you know so so that's why we are supportive to each other because we are not indulging into each other's area and so all of us are united and uh, without the support of my colleagues i think my advancements in endurology conference which is probably one of the most awaited conference in the country uh, would not have been very successful yes, so sir. i give my credit to my urology amdavad urology colleagues right. for that the very great that and one has to learn from that and uh, today topic dear friends uh, without wasting time what mistake not to do during rirs and dr kandar parik sir to be honest uh, he is the chairman sham urosurgical hospital his own center and uh, presently uh, he is working in sims uh, meringu hospital uh the this is one of the corporate hospital in amdavad he served 2014 and 18 and secretary west zone urology society of india 2017 19 he was council member urological society of india 2020 associated international board member ulis and now present year 2023 24 he is the president of uh, west zone urology society of india he conducted rirs workshops talks internationally nationally in fact uh, one of the Uh, a mentors for me also dr kandar parik sir uh, apart from uh, dr kandar sami sir during my 2006 7 period i started uh, and to, up to 2008 i used to attend and meet and uh, share my uh, initial experience with sir and he used to help me out mentor for rir cmast and euromed he run minimally access surgery training institute at sham urology hospital he has been invited faculty to moderate various sessions in world endourology conferences at mumbai amsterdam tp munich london in fact many 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 we learned and his passion for uh, uh, rirs uh, is reflected in terms of writing two books one is rirs uh, coffee table uh, by alone and it has become very successful book very cute book and second one is uh, flexible uh, erythroscopy along with kemal sarika uh, sir published by spring uh, well so these are the two uh, important uh, books which you should have and initial phases you can read so with this uh, today actually there is no uh, um, um, so official presentation we will have question answers i will be uh, questioning with whatever experience i have and not only uh, before concluding dr kandar parik sir son is also urologist uh, aditya from uh, uh, finished from nadia recently and he is uh, evolving surgeon now and one more son udit is also a physician and uh, for your kind information madam uh, beena madam is hod anesthesia ikd 
So entire family involved one way or other way with kidney diseases. So with this, uh, we will start the program. Already uh, 50 uh, people are online. So we will start the uh, talk, sir. The, our aim of the talk today is when initially uh, uh, after passing MCH and DNB, many of the institutes are not doing RIRS by their seniors. That is the first thing. So when they come out, uh, they also wanted to do RIRS because it is uh, competitive now. So my first question is, if they go and see, learn with you people or me or somebody else, what size is safe? Because some people have seen taking two centimeters in the first go. They say that we finished, but later on they may end up in problem. But I feel uh, what size with your experience, a junior most person should not take after which size you should not take, whether it is in pelvis, whether it is in upper calyx. Tell me, sir, how, how you choose size? So uh, it's, I think it's a very, very important question because, you know, the when you are learning certain things, you have to select a proper case. Most important is selection of a proper case because if you create a disaster with the first go, in that case, probably you lose interest into that technology as well as learning that particular method. So I will recommend that those who are juniors and those who have not done RIRS, juniors or seniors, whatever, uh, they should select a proper case, particularly a case up to 1.5 to maximum 2 centimeter in size. I will prefer if they keep it up to 1.5 centimeter. Uh, that is better. Right. Uh, they should avoid anatomical abnormal kidney. They should avoid very complex lower calicial anatomy. Take a, start with the simple cases first. Uh, because all of us, all urologists are expert in ureteroscopy. And flexible ureteroscopy is by, said to be extension of the uh, rigid ureteroscopy. So we know the anatomy of the ureter very well. Now we have to enter into the kidney with the flexible ureteroscopy. So I think if you select a proper anatomy, right. I think learning RIRS, it will be comparatively easy for a urologist. But you should know the anatomy well. Yes. Uh, so that is more important. Second question is, we will have a quick fire, sir, so that it let it be a, a very good session for future. Uh, uh, second question is, a lot of people ask, sir, RIRS is, uh, whenever we go inside, if the ureter is uh, tight, uh, how can we do, sir? How can we tell the patient, if the ureter is tight, uh, what not to be done? You, you also face, I also face, everybody face. When initially, when I cannot do RIRS, I used to feel bad. Are today I am not able to do. What should I tell to the patient? Uh, so how will you go about the size of the ureter? You uh, 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 not in a stented patient. Primary fresh patient you have taken. You told that RIRS we are taking only one centimeter stone is taken. What is your criteria where you will not do RIRS? So there are two things in the patient for a procedure. I always tell the patient that though RIRS will give you good result, good recovery, the only one point which is very, very important is that I should be able to enter into your pelvic license system. So I explain the patient before taking the patient in that there is a remote possibility that I may not be able to reach to the stone because of the anatomy is bad. Your ureter is tight. In that case, you, you put a double chest stent and come out. Okay. Do not try to do not try to force your instrument into ureter because ureter will not forgive you. That is very very important. That is you have to explain before the taking the patient into the operation theater when you are explaining to the procedure. Very now good. the patient has understood this. Now you are going in, and if you I mean the, my first step is to do a 4.5 inch ureteroscopy, a rigid semi rigid ureteroscopy to evaluate the ureter, the ureteric orifice the ureter and if there is any pathology in the ureter this is a, and the fourth purpose the the purpose which will solve is it could is, it can cause a passive dilation of the ureter also if if my scope is gripped by the ureteric wall which is 4.5 or a 6 french ureter uh, ureteroscope in that case probably it is safer to come out and do the procedure after 10 or 15 days 10 days are enough but some people say two, two weeks you wait that will dilate the ureter and that will make the success uh, successful surgery. Secondly, patient is also not offended or patient relatives are not offended because you have already explained him. Yes. In your interest, we will not proceed if the ureter is bad. So I think this is very, very important. The third question, 
ये लॉट ऑफ पीपल इन इन द डिस्ट्रिक्ट हेड क्वार्टर दे पुट द स्टेंट एंड विद इन टू डेज दे वांटेड टू गो इनसाइड बाय चांस इफ द इफ द इरेट्रोस्कोप अगेन डजेंट गो यू लूज योर फेस सो what is your recommendation you should not go early or you should go early how many days you have to wait for the rotoscopy uh yes sandarman i already said that we will wait at least for 10 days to at least for 10 days 10 days or 2 weeks I mean what did whatever is feasible 10 days are enough so to, to produce a sufficient dilation if you are extreme if the patient is extremely unlucky or surgeon is very unlucky in that case all that case only a 10 days dilatation may not be Yeah, will not allow you to enter in. Otherwise, I mean, our experience, most of the patients, I think, you can walk in. Secondly, you will be in a position to put even a ureteral exercise. Yes. So when you put, uh, because the ureter is very nicely dilated, so once you put the ureteral exercise, I think probably and especially when you are learning, that will help you a lot. Yes. So then next, uh, uh, there are uh, two definitive large size ureter sheath, small size, twelve by fourteen, twelve by fourteen. And nine point five by eleven point five. In your routine practice, in which cases uh, you will use twelve by fourteen? In which cases you use by nine point five? Honestly, routinely you are doing. Not in conference. There is no need for you to show the best vision of the world. In your routine case, without stent and with stent, what is your personal choice of the access sheet size? What I mean to say. Yeah, yeah. So I am a big fan of flexor. Uh, so uh, ureteral access sheet. Yes, sir. So what? What? So in my routine practice, I prefer to put a ten by twelve ureteral access sheet. That's my preference. Yeah. If ro- initially Rocomed was available, so I was putting. I'm giving you just the name of a company. It can be no anything. No problem, sir. No problem. So the so ten twelve ureteral access sheet was uh, is my preference because it will accommodate both. uh digital flexible ultrascope as well as the fiber optic flexible ultrascope now the time has changed all of us have now moved from the fiber optic uh, digital scope to the digital or limited use or uh, reusable uh, digital ultrascope so for that what you need is at least a 10 12 ultral access sheet so that it will accommodate secondly it will allow sufficient fluid return to come out so 10 12 is my preference if 10 12 is not available i use 11 13 12 14 i Have very rarely used when the patient is already pre-stented and the ureter is very nice and supple and the stone is very big. So at that time only I use twelve fourteen. Otherwise the ten twelve or eleven thirty with thirteen will suffice. So and if people ask, ah, uh, generally I do all cases because it's my own hospital. I doesn't matter much for cost for me. I do all cases under general anesthesia. I am adapted to the comfort of the respiration. Nicely I will powder. And three uh, to four thousand extra rupees will cost. But what is your criteria? You work in corporate. You work in your own hospital. You work in conference many times. Uh, when will you be comfortable? When you will be uncomfortable? For example, a patient is taking deep breathing. Large stone is there. You are a person who tries to powder. You don't believe in large lot of popcorn in pelvis. So, what what is your opinion on anesthesia? Where you will get difficulties in RIRs? Okay, so preferentially, as you say, I or do all the RIRs like you under general anesthesia. That's my preference. Okay. Because the, the desperation should be under your control. I have done uh, almost sixty-five to seventy-five RIRs under spinal anesthesia during the COVID time. Okay. Because okay. that time we were scared giving general anesthesia. So that time we were we uh, have done. Uh, I think we have published seventy-five uh, cases for uh, RIRs under spinal anesthesia. That was during the COVID time. But given a choice, I will certainly do RIRs under general anesthesia, where respiration is well under control. And because when you are especially firing a stone in upper calyx, and because of the respiratory excursion, kidneys moves a lot. At that time, you will not be able to fire on the laser very precisely. When you want to very make a very nice dust, or even if the stone fragment is very small, sometimes if the res- kidney moves, you are your laser fiber may hit the. Uh, Pelvic lysis, so the mucosa, and unnecessary it can cause the bleeding. And if the bleeding happens, bleeding or oozing happens in the to go to, in the initial part of the surgery, the entire charm of the surgery is gone. Yeah. Yes. The, so that is the key in our IR. So we have to see that we don't damage the mucosa, we don't cause bleeding. Yes. And so, yeah. 
sir uh, during rirs everybody uses flexible scope after the judioscopy you insert the access sheet you said 10 by 12 is the common sheet user when when where will you keep the access sheet uh, why where you will not keep more important is where you will not keep and if the ureter is tight where will you keep if your ureter is very accommodable where will you keep where is your comfort zone in cm so usually we put the ureter access sheet below the two to three centimeter below the UPJ. We don't want to put it in the pelvis, across the pelvis. That is one because pelvis is the renal pelvis. UPJ is the most unsupported part. So sometimes it can cause a trauma when you try to push in your ureteral access sheet up across the uh, UPJ. The second most important point is that if you want to, uh, to deflect the scope into the lower calyx, and if the ureteral access sheet is right up to the UPG, you will not be able to reach to the stone. So that's the reason you put the ureteral access sheet uh, two to three centimeters at least below, because the, the, the deflection part of the tip of the flexible scope is about six to seven centimeters. So it, it, has, it should allow the deflection go into the complex pelvic system or a lower calyx. Yes, sir. So, sir. Uh, e e there is a lot of controversy. All the literature, EAU, EAU says that urine culture is mandatory. Many of the people in India doesn't do urine culture. They will send it or they don't send it. They take up the case. What if you see in the pelvis, you will not proceed even if the access sheet is there. Is it the pus flakes? Is it the stone flakes? Is it the matrix? What, what, what picture in the beginning you say that, no, I don't want it to do uh, uh, RIRS. I will either go for PCNL or stop and do stenting, even though ureter is good. Where okay. will you stop the procedure? Yeah. So uh, when a patient comes to you, most of most of us, even I mean, the patient is in a hurry to get rid of the stone. Yes, sir. So patient sometimes insists or surgeon doesn't want to lose the patient. So he will do the procedure without urine culture. In my routine practice, I always recommend that urine culture is mandatory. Yes, urine sir. culture should be done. It should be negative. Treat it well with the antibiotic because we and and I don't have a fear of patient running out of my uh, hospital if I get, uh, order for the urine culture. So I request that everybody should get a urine culture done. Even if patient is coming from outside and if the patient is taking your appointment, tell the patient that please get a urine culture test done and come to me. I send me the report if the negative. So I think that is first thing. Now supposing if the urine culture is negative also and still you go into the ureter as a kidney. And sometimes you see that to your surprise that culture is negative, but there are a lot of pus flags and a lot of pus coming yeah. from above. So in that case, I think probably better to put a stent and come out. Don't compromise on that. Otherwise, septicemia is the worst complication of RIRS. We yeah. don't want to have septicemia or post-op high-grade fever. Uh, so my recommend, and even if in spite of doing all everything, sometimes you face this problem once in a year, but the frequency may not be that, not be very great. Uh, if you are careful while operating, if the urine culture is negative, if the kidneys are good, I think you are you can cut down on your antibiotic use also, and you can do a perfect job for the patient. Patient can be discharged on the very next day. Yes, sir. One question from Vivek Kunganti on the line. A lot of people are on the line, and uh, they ask that uh, if the HU units are more, does it make your decision of RIRS or with laser? Uh, it should not be a too much uh, difference. Uh, I, I don't think uh, it makes more difference. Actually, I'm sure that's another more important good, for you, you, more, you, also, you also have a same experience that if the, if the stone is hard, probably initially you are in a position to make a very nice dust, golden yes. dust. Uh, when, the, when the stone is hard. So sometimes I like hard stone actually. Yes. When the stone is soft, the moment you touch with the laser fiber, it will be fragmented. Though fragmented. It, you know, the fragments are 2 or 3 mm, but you don't like this. Yes. What sir. we yes, want sir. to do is a very fine dusting. And so if the stone is hard, I think you can. You may little, take a little longer time, and now in the uh, with the availability of uh, thulium fiber laser, I think the time factor is also reduced significantly. Yes. So uh, for me, it doesn't make any difference whether it's a 1500 HU or a 700 HU. On the contrary, laser the HU more the problem sometimes because stone will be fragmented. The moment you yes. touch the stone, it will be fragmented, and sometimes you don't like it. Some yeah. people may feel so that you want to make like powder, so HU units should not make difference. In fact, you will enjoy initially because stone does not move and fine dust will be produced. Ahmad Majruk is also very enthusiastic from Trichy. He asked a very important question. If the access sheet is tightly fitting one centimeter above the UVJ, your heart says that I wanted to do today, I wanted to do today. 
but uh, to hold it in that position without injury sometimes it may slip back assistant may not be able to hold too much access sheet is outside will you proceed in such circumstances or you are not happy i i would not like to keep my ureteral access sheet at the level of 1 cm or 2 cm above uvj because then you don't get a proper fulcrum uh, yeah. sir your movement in the kidney is also compromised it is in such a case in case if you want to proceed okay backload the scope over the guide wire why do you want to put a ureteral access sheet simply backload the scope over the guide wire and finish the procedure rather than or put a stent and come out next time you go yeah so lot of people ask these are the two controversial questions but most commonly asked i know it has uh, no meaning to ask which flexible scope i wanted to buy which laser i wanted to buy fun fortunately even i might have asked you in uh, kerala ka, one of the conference to you sir please tell me which scope to buy so we should not uh, feel uh, bad to answer them so please give your honest answer two three choices at least uh, in the present era what scope and what laser are better because your words of wisdom uh, are very important to the juniors the purpose okay. of this conference this meeting is also that correct correct sandramon thank you for asking the same question because uh, all of us are asked this question many times in the past and in the present the, the answer in the past was something different and then in the present the answer the answer is very yes. different yeah right because in the past if somebody asked me this question before 10 years i would have said that okay use flex like 62s or use p7 or p6 whatever is available if you want to buy only one scope but now i think probably uh, though both the scopes are very good uh, unfortunately both the scopes will be a part of history maybe after 2 3 years uh, because of the availability of a limited use ureteroscope or a uh, single use ureteroscope whatever is your preference uh, so right now if somebody ask me i will say that okay uh, in india we have got a limited use because we have got a financial constraint also so we cannot use a single use ureteroscope like boston scientific uh, lithoview it's very good scope but it's expensive and we want to run the same scope for at least 10 15 times so in that case now we have availability of a very good scope by biorate it's a very 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 good scope it is available in now the smallest size i think it's about 7.5 or 8.5 scope 7.5 yes yeah. similarly we have a uh, one scope from uh, uh, unique medical that is deepra scope uh, the huge med uh, is also now the recent entry and it is also a very 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 good scope pusen for unfortunately they do not have much holding in the country otherwise the pusen scopes were also because we have done a trial with them they were also very good but uh, i think they don't have a proper marketing team here so i think right now presently we have got a indovesi that's a biorate scope or a deepra scope or a humate scope uh, if i'm sorry if i'm forgetting some yes, other scope you have, you have openly answered How about the laser sir this is a very common question and in fact it is controversial question also they simply ask two things sir that i am first time buying i am a fresher his father in law and father is not very rich they, he wanted to buy either 20 watts homium laser he wanted to do only stone or uh, the 30 35 watts uh, thulium fiber laser what what should i buy they will ask now this question is a bit tricky to answer because we have not reached to the consensus on this yes sir i i have both the holmium as well as Even the I have both. laser i'm sure that you have got many scope many lasers rather than having only two lasers from different companies so uh, but what i do at this moment is uh, for the renal stone my preference is a thulium fiber laser when i do rirs for the ureteric stone impacted ureteric stone especially i do a holmium laser i use a holmium laser very good and if i want to do a pcnl standard pcnl again i prefer a holmium laser because i want to fragment the stone i don't want dust the stone yeah and if some some people who do mini pcnl on a regular basis they still use a thulium fiber laser and they can solve the purpose yes. so that this is my policy now if you want to buy only one laser at this moment uh i think the balance answer would be that you go for a thulium fiber laser which can solve the purpose for the kidney and for the ureter you already have got a pneumatic lithoclast or uh, if it, yeah so you can do that Still, I, when i asked the same question to dr traxer sometime back he said that he is even for the ureteric stone also he is using a thulium fiber laser but the word of caution is that when you use a thulium fiber laser for both for the kidney and the ureter 
I think you should understand the perfect settings because the company people will tell you that you can go up to 2000 frequency in this laser. You don't need to go that much, even though you don't need to use 200 frequency also. All of us, when we started using a thulium fiber laser, we, come, we started with the 100 frequency, 200 frequency with 0.1 or 0.2 joules. Yeah. But now, now we have come back to the settings what we are using for the holmium laser. That is, a, that is a 10 frequency or 15 frequency. So in the ureter, recommended is that you do not exceed more than 10 frequency. And yes. in the kidney, you don't go beyond 20. That's the uh, ideal. Uh, the last two answers are the most best answer I have heard. Even from my heart, I will say that he, he, he is not diplomatic. He has given a very fair answer. Please understand no conflicts of interest here. You choose whatever you want after initial experience with us uh, because we are slightly experienced than you. As, the time, as he said 10 years back, we used to crazily use FlexX2. Even FlexX2 company now says that uh, uh, the things have changed. So that he clearly mentioned he might have taken FlexX2 or P7. Now the role of uh, uh, Indovazu Biorad a huge med is there. Even Pusin is good, but marketing is not good. The laser homium versus thulium, both are equally good. In ureter, be careful with thulium fiber laser, sorry, is telling. And slightly, 51% maybe you will prefer TFL because it's a multi-purpose. So with this, we'll go to the next question. Very important question asked by uh, Ramakrishna. If upper ureter kink is there, you have not stented. You, it looks, uh, 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 you wanted to do RS for a small stone. What uh, what makes you to not to proceed? Either you try flexible scopy or rigid ureteroscope, you try two wires or one wire. What is whenever upper ureter kink is seen? What what you will not do, sir? What you will do? Okay, so it's very co common to find a very uh, upper ureter kink. Sometimes kinks are very very bad also. So uh, the most important thing is that your guide wire has to go across that kink. So yeah. you are selecting a correct guide wire that is point number one. So I my preference in such a king situation would be use as the Teromo guide wire. So usually Teromo guide wire passes through the kink. Now, uh, otherwise my routine preference is uh, using a sensor guide wire because the tip is flexible and the shaft is steep. So that they allow me uh, to backload my either neutral access sheet or guide wire is not passing across. I use a Teromo guide wire. Secondly, uh, you can use a MERS maneuver in order to in order to facilitate the passage of your guide wire into the kidney. Once the guide wire passes into the kidney, what I do is that I backload a ureteric catheter over, over it and then change the guide wire from terumo to the sensor guide wire. Okay. So that the, you have got a steep, super steep guide wire in the ureter, sitting in the ureter and that will straighten the kink and that will facilitate it. Now, uh, Sometimes what you can do is that you can pass a double human ureteric catheter over this sensor guide wire and put another guide wire because the, because then that guide wire will because double human catheter you can you can pass two guide wires from the lumen there are two different lumens right so yes. what we have, so what will happen that when you try to backload your ureteral access sheet or uh, uh, the flexible scope over the one guide wire another guide wire stays. So that your kink remains the straight. The most important thing because there is another guide wire sitting there. So two guide wires you will pass. One guide wire for loading the scope. After that you will remove it. Other guide wire keeps uh, ureter straight. And uh, that should be the smaller one. So Arnath Reddy, in extension of this question, asked her, if you are ureteroscopy primary, you are passing the, you pass the flexible scope, you started doing, you feel little resistance of the movement. Can we take out the outside guide wire if you have little little resistance for the movements of the scope yeah yeah that's not become in routine practice i don't use a safety guide i okay. have never i'm sure that you are also not using a safety guide yes. because indian ureters we are uh, facing a lot of problem because indian ureters are not as big as the western ureters so they hardly accommodate a safety guide wire and a ureteral access seal so so many times what we do is that we put one uh, guide wire over the guide wire we try to pass ureteral access sheet or if the ureteral access sheet is not going, you backload the ureteroscope over the guide wire and take out the guide wire. So there is nothing like a safety guide wire. Now, like according to the EAU or AUA guideline, you must put a safety guide wire, right? Okay. That's a that's a recommendation. But unfortunately, uh, I am not following You cannot that. be able to accommodate both guide wire and scope. Yeah so, yeah, so that is a problem we are facing day-to-day -day practice. So... Uh, with the experience, uh, I think uh, if you don't have a safety guide wire, it's okay for me. But uh, theoretically speaking, if you have a safety guide wire, it is good. Sir, in upper ureter stone is very tricky, most difficult. You have a paper also on that. 
somebody wants to push back they will push back if push back is not happening pneumatic lithotripter is used have you have you ever uh, recommend uh, have you uh, are you comfortable using flexible scopy in upper ureter doing the stone whether it is even rigid scopy also this is very important question for the youngsters they are afraid if they don't have rirs they are afraid that it may go up if good rir surgeon says that let it go up and i will go and do it but when you are doing in situ everybody is afraid even senior is afraid because uh, the laser touching the mucosa a long stone if it is impacted what is in your mind and what you will not do and what you will do sir so uh, a periuretic stone most of the times when you try to, when you do a semi rigidoscopy and to so most of the times if it is in the uh, periureter it is pushed back into the kidney that is the most safe thing to do okay handling the scope in the upper ureter the flexible scope is a very very tricky situation as you said yes, it's sir. extremely extremely difficult situation difficult. especially yeah. uh, if the stone is supposing in the mid ureter you are not in a position to keep the ureteral exercise also in proper so that it is keeping a lot of it is the part okay. of the ureteral exercise remains too much outside the patient's uh, body so okay. manipulation is extremely difficult but i have done many cases with the flexible ureteroscopy in the upper ureter where there is a, sometimes there is a kink it is not allowing my semi rigid ureteroscope to go in so preferentially if my semi rigid ureteroscope goes into the upper ureter i will always use a semi rigid ureteroscope but if the ureteroscope is not going and if there is a kink uh, or the, the length is short because i use a short 4.5 inch ureteroscope in most of my cases in that case uh, probably i will do same uh, flexible ureteroscopy with the the scope which is available to me i have to be very careful that i don't hit the mucosa with my laser fiber and especially in the impacted stone one has to be extremely careful secondly because there is impacted stone the water flow is not going so the vision may not be that great that is also another point which is very very important so your experience matters the most at that particular time. if you have difficulty better to do pcl also of course of course if you if you are because in most of our indian doctors are master in pcn i think they can finish the job with the pcn uh, if you can reach to the stone yes sir so we have 30 minutes sir done yeah, another 10 questions only i will ask and we'll conclude the program once you go into the uh, into the kidney with flexible scope uh, do you think uh, if the water return is not there what will you do because somebody will be flushing with water or gravity are flushing with water you wanted to start the case after 5 minutes if the water is not coming out your vision may decrease and unnecessarily create problem so what uh, uh, what is the message if the water is not coming down you you will have in your mind in your routine do do you see the water coming out is important and what measures you will take if it is not coming out so the most important thing is the selection of the ureteral axial sheet size uh there has to be a difference of at least 2 french between the the diameter of the flexible scope and the ureteral axial sheet lumen yes sir. so that will allow the water to come out easily during the procedure because people sometimes use as you ask me this question that if you use a 9.5 french ureteroscope and if you try to push in whatever uh, the limited use digital ureteroscopes available in the market they say it is 7.5 so it can easily go through 9.5 it goes that is not important the important is that there has to be a fluid return as you said otherwise it will raise the intrainer pressure too much and you will end up in the complex either it can cause a oozing and bleeding and then uh, uh, the then post op septicemia whatever so i think uh, that is the reason i said the 10 french ureteral exercise at this moment with whatever yes. scope available yes. one has to use and one has to when you put ureteral exercise you have to check during the surgery that there is a enough fluid return by the side of the scope Yes, sir. One more question from Chandra Mohan Gaddala from Anantapur, who is a critical analyzer of the topics. Uh, he says fiber size. Still, after so much discussion, also certain people are using still 350 micron fiber. His intention is what size of the fiber uh, should be used in RIRS? In fact, okay. So I think two type, two size fibers are routinely used by in RIRS. Uh, one is the 200 micron fiber which is yeah. the ideal ideal most and you can use a 265 or 275 micron fiber which is available yes. Yes. 375 never used in rirs that is one if the stone is in the why people are reluctant using 200 micron fiber is that it is expensive i think comparative to the larger fiber yeah. secondly it is it there is a wear and tear is more 
and that is the reason people are not using so initial my even even in my initial practice what i used to do was to restrict uh, using a 200 micron fiber especially in a complex anatomy or when i want to go into the lower calyx or when i am making the demonstration because it will allow more fluid to go into the picture will be good intraoperatively right so i initially i was uh, these are the cases where i was using 200 micron fiber and for the upper calyxial stone when the scope sto scope is can remain straight or slightly deflected in that case you i was using 265 micron fiber or 275 micron fiber whatever is available so these uh, are but, the two you recommend 200 or maximum 270 yeah, yeah yeah that these are the recommendation yes correct yes, sir. but i i in my practice now i have started using 200 micron fiber in every case Chandramor again asked Godala uh, that uh, if initial phase you get some bleeding by chance, maybe because of the pressure or decompression, somebody remove the scope and go in. It really annoys for a junior and uh, it is not a welcome sign. At what level you will stop it or at, up to what level you will proceed? A, a hazy vision is there, RBC will be moving, uh, red vision uh, sometimes becomes so hazy that large stone cannot be done. So. Uh, well, sometimes what will you do if such a uh, initial bad experience usually experienced persons will somehow get out by pulling out the water quickly 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 readjusting the scope parameters everything that comes with experience but for a beginner what is your suggestion so for the beginner one more thing is that you have to be very very careful uh, while lazing the stone and moving the stone in the uh, moving the scope in the pelvic license system not only the laser can cause the injury, even the flexible scope can also cause the injury. The, the tip, when the tip is deflected and the deflected tip is, uh, you bring, try to bring it out from the upper calyx or the middle calyx sometimes, it can brush the um, infundibular wall and then it can start uh, oozing. Secondly, intrarenal pressure, if it is not maintained well, the, the somebody is pushing through it too much, too hard, uh, even if you are not touched with the laser, sometimes there is a oozing. And once the vision is gone, I think probably uh, the entire charm of the surgery is gone. So for the junior people, you don't want to end up in trouble. Put a double gest and then come out, do the procedure right. next. That right. is the best, best right. strategy. Sir, have you ever recommend uh, juniors or uh, seniors with stent or without stent, without accessory surgery? What is your, uh, not doing uh, great or doing great, without access sheath, do you recommend RIRS in any case? So, what do you mean to say is that... Uh, do, Without do, access sheath, RIRS. Sheathless, RIRS. Sheathless. Uh, so, I have done... Uh, supposing that the ureter is, uh, ureter is not very friendly, but still I feel that I have to finish this procedure and ureter is not very tight also. And my ureteral access sheath is not going and if the stone is small size and uh, if I have intention of making a fine dust, I can backload the scope of the guide wire and uh, I can simply uh, for, for, uh, make a very, very fine dust and put a DJ and come out. I do not. I do not do a wireless, a wireless flexible endoscopy on a routine base. That's right. not my. Case. Yes. So you clearly mentioned this answer. You answered uh, extremely uh, appropriate answer is wireless. No, sheathless. Yes, you can do whenever uh, the ureter is borderline. Sorry, saying access sheath doesn't go. But if you see the lumen, uh, one time you can go. But for smaller stone, he said quick dusting and come out. It can be done. Are not for very large stones on this thing. We also are not comfortable without access sheet. And many of the people in the world, uh, pioneers, they use access sheet for the general information. Uh, uh, the RIRS, uh, uh, without, when, when you use CM in RIRS, you usually while doing lithotripsy, you don't require unless for academic purpose. Uh, RGP, access sheet insertion, or any other where CM is used, should we have CM before doing RIRS in the theater or not? Like a lot of people, oh, uh, previous generation, URSL, they used to do in uh, peripheries without CM also. But sometimes we get land. What about RIRS? So I think uh, do not work in a compromised situation if you uh, want to give the best result and you don't want to land up in trouble. So I recommend that you must have a CM in the OT. But at the same time, I use CM very, very limited. Extremely limited, you can say so. Uh, in so, uh, if I can give you my data, my uh, the exposure time of uh, any RIRS procedure is not more than six seconds. So, only six shots only are given, if at all required. 
I don't, I mean, people, now there is a concept of LRIS, low radiation is possible. So you can uh, uh, use it when doing a RIRS also. That's a great advantage over the PCNL. You are using a minimum radiation. And I use now with my experience, because I'm using a semi ureteroscope, I can go into the ureter, I check the ureter, the ureter is fine, put a guide wire under the vision, so no, uh, uh, no radiation, the use. Even the ureteral access sheet also, I put with my tech. There is no need to do RGP so, also routinely. So I don't do RGP. You routinely. don't do RGP. I, I do RGP only and only if the, I don't find a stone. If I don't I go in the kidney, I don't find a stone, I do RGP. Otherwise, I don't do RGP routinely. Uh, this used to be a procedure before sometime, but now I don't do it. Sir, last five questions. Uh, commonly asked question. What are the common laser settings for dusting you use in homium? What are the laser settings in thulium fiberglass? One answer. What your yeah. favorite settings? There is so, no uh, but you oh, yeah, of course there are there are no actually no no perfect settings. If I yes. you to you, so but the idea is that when you want to do a dusting, your pulse duration has to be a long pulse duration. Your frequency has to be high, and your joule uh, should be low. So I usually begin with, uh, when I use a holmium laser, I usually begin with 0.5 to 0.6 joules and my frequency would be somewhere between 12 and 15. Uh, I hardly exceed more than 20 because I'm using low power laser for okay. my, like uh, many of us, you are using in a private practice. For the, tool, for, the, for the fragmentation part, you use higher joule. So maybe it is 0.8 or one joule and frequency of uh, seven or ten somewhere and the short pulse duration so this is for the fragmentation so, for the for the thulium fiber laser uh, initially we were using a lot of frequency as i told you before but now we have come back to the frequency between somewhere between 10 and 20 depending on the location of the stone and we start with 0 0.2 0 0.3 maximum uh, joule or maybe 0.4 sometimes then the frequency will go down Ultimately, the idea is that your total watt, which is used for the for the thulium fiber laser, should not exceed more than ten. Yeah. And for the, for for the kidney, I do not exceed more than twenty. Total yeah. watt. Fantastic. So for all the uh, viewers, he said clearly that 0.5 start. There is no harm. You can increase to 0.7 frequency. He said 12 to 20. Similarly, uh, 0 0.3, 0 0.5 in thulium fiber laser and uh, 10 to 20. I also use the same. So. Uh, keep initial 50 cases, whatever the seniors say. Once you know the mission, the speed, everything, logistics, you will have experience and you can go whatever the way you want. There are 100 laser settings. This is for beginners, actually, this interaction. Now, sir, uh, when will you use a basket? You, usually, uh, there are limited role baskets. There's a problem because your assistant also should be good in basketing. You cannot do sometimes. So it takes time and it frustrates. In calyx, you are nicely seeing the stone with minimal flexion. Will you proceed or a large stone, if you basket, you may get into trouble. So quick uh, uh, guidelines for your basketing, what you do in your OT and which basket you use routinely. So uh, that all depends on what philosophy you believe in, whether you want to take a stone fragment for the analysis or not. Now, uh, in my, my initial preference would be to make a very, very fine dust and when you go into the center of the stone, whether it's a large stone or a small stone, when you go into the center of the stone, that time what happens is that you find it very difficult to produce a very fine dust, like you used to you used to make a fine dust in the periphery. So in that case, what I do is that I take the central part for the analysis. I send all the patients for the stone analysis. Some people do not believe in this, but I do that. When the stone is supposing one centimeter size stone I am doing, in that case, what I do is that initially I make a fine dust and then I fragment the stone in three, four pieces because the one centimeter size fragmentation numbers will be less. Yeah, so yeah. In, that, in that case, three, four pieces, take it out. So you produce a complete clearance on table. Yes, this is the only thing to complain. If the stone is very, very large, in that case, you will not be able to take out all the fragments. So initially make a very nice dust, go till chase only one stone rather than chasing multiple stones. And then go to the center of the stone, break it into a few pieces and take it out. So baskets, I, I do use baskets in, in many cases. But uh, at the Basket same time... you use for these purposes, sir? What, one or two baskets names routinely you use? Uh, I, there are many companies making again a yeah. basket. So my preference is to use a Boston Scientific uh, baskets. That's my personal preference. And then... Dakota uh, basket? Dakota? 
Dakota, Dakota, yeah, Dakota, Dakota have used because it is an advantage that if you grab a stone and the disengaging the stone will be very very easy with the Dakota because it, there is an, another uh, you can open it further so you can drop that stone but Dakota is a bit expensive so I think probably everybody may not buy that Dakota uh, basket but regular regular zero tip basket uh, you can use it or you can use a uh, from Cook side Cook uh, or maybe some Indian uh, companies also make good basket. So you can use it. What antibiotics you use and how long you use honestly? So uh, it's a very, very interesting question, I think. And uh, I think I, uh, I would like to certainly answer this question, Chandramal. Uh, if the culture is negative, uh, in that case, when we admit the patient on the day of the surgery, till the patient is in the hospital, is covered by intravenous antibiotics. My personal preference is epimentazobectum. This is what I use right now. Uh, so, uh, in preoperatively one injection and uh, postoperatively eight hourly when the, the patient is discharged on the very next day. So, it means that you are giving at least three or four shots of intravenous antibiotic. Right. And then the patient, patient goes home. We put simply on a very, very simple antibiotic, oral antibiotic. So, uh, I am not continuing the intravenous antibiotic, which I used to do it before when I started the practice because I was very much worried about the septic symbiotic. Probably the, the, the reason was that uh, insufficient uh, uh, knowledge about the procedure when we started, we were self-learner uh, actually. And yes. then I went, we went with, uh, the, because there were no uh, formal training program happening formal at training. the, like, the yes. company. And there were no RIS workshops also organized there, like you are organizing or I am organizing. So then when I went to Dr. Texas uh, clinic, I saw that they are giving antibiotic only one day. And yes. then... Uh, I understood that uh, the basics of uh, the intrarenal pressure, the sterilization part. Now I'm using a plasma sterilization in my hospital for several years. So my infection rate is comparatively very, very low because urine culture is negative. Intrarenal pressure is maintained low. The, the instruments are properly sterilized. And even the reusable instruments, what we are using, the guide wire, the basket, everything is done with the plasma sterilization. So uh, my infection rate is very low and I'm happy giving antibiotic only for one particular day. If the kidneys, uh, if I find that the stone is big, there are a lot of turbidity after post-operative period. And if patient complains of kind of fever or something, then I may continue uh, the antibiotic for a longer time. Uh, yes. The same principle. Last two questions, sir. Uh, what type of sterilization routinely? Daily you use steroid sterilization or chemical sterilization is also okay? These are last two, two questions. Uh, I think for majority of the people, chemicals, people are using Parasaf or Cydex, anything. Yes, sir. But in my all patients, I am very, very careful uh, using, uh, uh, I'm using only plasma sterilizer. You can use ETO also, but ET with ETO, the problem is that if you have got limited number of scopes and if you are doing two, three procedures, I think you are held up. Uh, so, plasma sterilization takes only 25 to, uh, sorry, 38 minutes. sterilization, okay, because everybody cannot buy steroid. I, I, I understand. I, I use 7 to 8 years chemical sterilization. Uh, I got away with it. Now, I also using, but in between cases, sometimes we use chemical sterilization. Is it okay? You know, if, you, if, you, if you wash it properly, if your instruments are washed properly, if the sterilization, if you keep uh, frequently change the sterilization, because some people think that they put it in the side the purpose is solved. It's not solved. You have to sterilize the your flush the channels also with the side X. Do a proper sterilization. But it's a chemical sterilization is, uh, to my mind, at this moment with the availability of plasma, I'm not using it. But everybody cannot buy plasma because of various reasons. So I think then you have to be very careful and do it uh, properly. I think then chemical sterilization is okay at this moment. Sir, last question of the day. DJ stenting what size, how many days in all cases or not all cases? If you have pre-stented also, will you stent? These are the last question. Okay. So DJ stent, if the stone is, stone is large and I have uh, done a dusting and a few fragments, yes. If the operating time is more, if I use a urethral extra sheet and if the operating time exceeds more than 45 minutes or 60 minutes, yes, digest tent, yes. And I use 624 for a man patient, men and 622 in a female patient because I want a little bit of part of it to remain in the uh, bladder. And uh, if the stone is very small, as I told you that if it is a very small stone, one centimeter size stone, and I've fragmented and taken out with the basket, in that case, sometimes I get away putting only a ureteric catheter postoperatively for a day, and I take out the ureteric catheter very next day, and I don't keep the stent. 
So thank you very much, sir. Your AIE is uh, this year also going to be there. What are the dates, sir? So uh, advancements in endurology conference we are organizing every two yearly. This time we are doing it in uh, uh, month of December, 15th, 16th and 17th of December, 2020. December 16, 17th. 15, 16, 17, three days. And Friday, Saturday, Sunday? Friday, Saturday, Sunday in Ahmedabad. At uh, the same convention center where we did it last time at uh, Club 07, at this moment, uh, that is a convention I center. I almost attended last five extraordinarily uh, yeah, programs. Not only, and, not, uh, only attend, not only attended, you have done a MRI. Yeah, I have so, done surgeries also. Most, and most, uh, any so early it, registration fees you have kept now? Right now, it is 9,000 rupees for three days, including yes. GS. So, it comes around 7,000. But I think next month, April 1st, Probably the, the rates will be 12,000 on. But this was a special price kept for the UCCON. And uh, again, we are happy to say that we have got a confirmation from Dr. Oliver Traxer, Dr. Saeed Bin Amri, and uh, many other international faculty in the field of uh, whole lab, uh, bipolar nucleation. What are, the surgery, what are the surgeries you are going to demonstrate, sir, apart from so, RIRS? So, RIRS will be having four or five cases. Of course, you will be one of them who will be demonstrating. Secondly, uh, and Olivier and myself are going to do RIRS. We'll have, uh, this time, we'll have um, uh, Holep. We have invited Dr. Fernando Gomez from uh, Spain. Uh, I'm waiting for his confirmation. So if he comes, it will be excellent because he's the best surgeon, one of the best surgeons in the world at this moment for Holep surgery. Uh, we'll be demonstrating two flap to a bladder tumor resection. We will be demonstrating uh, pediatric urology, especially the pediatric stones. Maybe you will be doing the pediatric stone. And uh, we will be having a uh, uh, psychoiotic reflux uh, surgery endoscopically, which we demonstrated last time also. So mm -hmm. Dr. Teggul had come last time from, uh, he, he has the highest experience of using this uh, reflux kind of a material. And uh, we are going to have a robotic surgeries, different robotic surgery, different robots like Medtronic uh, and um, uh, the Da Vinci and the Cambridge robot. And right. also we are taking a a part of the technology session this time. So we'll have a Eurolift resume and uh, equiblation surgery uh, for the uh, for the process. So newer technology we are going to demonstrate this time. Good, One last question for just uh, respecting the audience because still total 250 audience participated in the recent past. This is the largest number. Uh, Vijay Karla has asked uh, um, uh, um, specifically hospital uh, uh, the, the Catheter Foley's post op should be placed or not? Okay, so uh, post operatively, in my all patients, I put Foley's catheter for a day because yeah. patients are there only in the. Uh, so, first, the first 24 hours, I would like to prevent the intrarenal reflux uh, because of the double gestation which is placed. But uh, that's, that, I, when I conducted a workshop in Nepal, uh, so that time they don't have a habit of putting a peripheral catheter post operatively. But I'm happy putting what, at least for a day. Yes. So with this, uh, we are just nearing one hour, 58 minutes. Uh, fantastic talk, sir. Uh, one thing I appreciate is that you have not used one person diplomacy. You have answered from your heart. This uh, YouTube link will, I'm telling you, will be there uh, with very high respect. People will watch again and again. You have really spoken from your heart with your experience. Uh, these tips for seniors may look very small, but every junior, 300, uh, 300 urologists are coming. They have to learn RIRS. I think it will be very, very useful. Not only surgery we are seeing by uh, the, your surgeries, uh, these things, but sometimes answering quickly uh, the exact answers uh, without uh, confusing the audience. You have made it. My purpose is 100% served. Thank you very much, sir. Wish you all thank the best you, for your EI. Thank you, Chandra Mohan, for the opportunity. And I wish good luck to all our audience. Thank, thank you. you so much. Thank, thank you so much. You.